Hi everyone, it's Margaret Manning here with lifeafterdeath.com. We are a community of people who are fascinated by the topic of life after death, about near-death experience, uh, reincarnation, and we have guests uh, we interview who are experts in these topics and also have a conversation which is open and balanced and, um, and free. <laughs> so we have a guest today that I'm so excited to introduce. His name is Ken Ross. Ken is the son of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Now, as you may know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was a Swiss uh, psychiatrist and hospice pioneer who wrote a book called On Death and Dying, which changed the conversation about death and dying all around the world. Now, Ken manages her foundation, it's the EKR Foundation, and also manages all of the relationships with books that, and, and research papers that she, she left behind. And he's a strong advocate to maintain and amplify her legacy. So welcome, Ken. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. It's really wonderful to have you here. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of your mother, as were a lot of people. And uh, thank you for the work that you're doing to keep it all going. So, Ken, I have a question for you, because um, Elizabeth was one of these people who sat by the bedside of dying patients regularly. That was, and, you know, I've seen lots of in interviews with her and, and videos. Can you tell us a little bit about what she thought herself personally, to the best of your knowledge, about near-death experiences and life after death? What was her thought on that? Well, as you can imagine, my mother sat with thousands and thousands of patients, yeah. you know, and they had been in motorcycle accidents. They'd had sudden death, slow death, you name it. But a number of them came back through resuscitation and so forth. And universally, they all had the same experience. So, you know, it's one thing if you hear something half a dozen times, a dozen times. But if you hear the same story thousands of times over, you know, several decades, you know, <laughs> my mother said that's proof to other people. You know, they said she was imagining things and projecting willful thinking and, and whatever. But, you know, universally, no matter what their language, beliefs, culture, whatever, you know, they all had the same experience of, you know, transitioning into that ethereal body floating above their physical body. They could see who's in the room. They could tell you what they were wearing, what procedures they did. And, you know, depending on how far it went, some continued on, you know, through the white tunnel. Some met people who had died before. But, you know, everyone had different experiences. It's like everyone's death and grief is unique. Each one had somewhat unique experience, but yeah. there was common themes. Did she ever make a comment to you about her own feelings about life after death? Did she, did she have any experiences herself that validated that or matched those experiences? Um, she did a number of things with the Monroe Institute, trying to have out-of-body experiences. Now, I wasn't around in that part of her life, but I have read about them a little bit. And mm -hmm. she said, oh, absolutely, she left her body and could see things and knew things she couldn't possibly know, you know, as a physical being. So she could get wow. into other people's minds and, and, and have, you know, an, a greater knowledge of the world, the universe, and nature than she could possibly have as a physical being. I'm really glad that you mentioned that one because uh, a lot of people, like you said, do experience this being out of the body and seeing what's going on around them. But I was interviewing Dr. Moody, R Raymond Moody, about this same topic a few months ago, and he was saying that, which made a difference, which was that it's the consciousness of what the doctors are thinking. Like people were able to not just see the doctors and see what they were doing, but they could re kind of read their minds. Like there was this exactly. un there was this unity that was going on. Is that what your what Elizabeth said as yeah, well? They were, they were they were a part of everything. You know, they were they could be inside and a part of each of the doctors. They could you know see what was happening on the different instruments. You know, things that you couldn't see obviously with your eyes closed, or you know, and also their bodies were whole again. If they couldn't hear, they could hear again. If they yeah, that's incredible. Again, if they had amputated legs, their body was whole. And this is a universal thing that every single person experienced. Were there any situations where she uh, personally, that you know of, personally went through the near-death experience with the person? In other words, a lot of times I've heard that the life review that a lot of people say they go through, this movie of their life kind of goes before their eyes, that sometimes the people sitting by the bedside actually 
feel or can see that same experience. Did she mention that at all? She did not mention that, but she said she could she could see the people physically leaving. The, the person went from like wow. a human being to like a statue. You could see like the soul leaving. So she didn't experience what they were experiencing, but she could physically see that they had made their transition. Wow. And she said that was very interesting to see how the body completely changed when the soul left. It became an inanimate, you know, statue or wooden block. Yeah. That's yeah, really soul is so much a part yeah. of us. Wow. That's, I mean, I, I know that, um, you know, I've read things like everybody has, you read these things, what, don't know what to believe, but that there is a certain amount of weight that leaves your body when you die. It's some right. point grams. It's not much, right, but yeah, it, I read that. you know, That's interesting. yeah, it's really interesting that there is something that happens. And, um, I know when my mom died and I, I was with her when she died, but when I got to the hotel, to the hotel, to the hospital, um, you know, I could see, like the air was full of little vibe light and little sparkly things. I mean, it was really, you could really sense there was something outside that wasn't her anymore, you know, right. and maybe that's the way of, did she just, how she described it? The, the, the visual appearance. Well, she the, said they, they just <clears throat> physically change it's the same person, but it's, and yet they're someone totally different. It's, it's not a person anymore. It's just like the cocoon. That was her wow. favorite metaphor is a cocoon and the butterfly. <laughs> she, she, did she ever write a book about that? Did she ever write about her near death experiences? Uh, the, her conversations? Uh, she has a book called the tunnel and the light. And that's very much about NDEs. <clears throat> so she has many wonderful stories in that book. And then uh, somewhere around here in my little library, I have another book, <clears throat> this book here. Ah, on life after death. Yes. I, <laughs> I didn't know she wrote that one. I should read I that myself. A book you might like. <clears throat> yeah. But what was, what was on that book? Do you happen to know what she covered? Was it interviews and conversations or was it something more philosophical? Uh, that book was kind of interesting because that book and A Tunnel in the Light are taken from her actual interviews um, and presentations. So to me, they're kind of easier to read because it's my mother having a conversation mm. with an audience. It's not just my mother, you know, typing away by herself. So in a way, I find some people like these books because it's my mother being more conversational. And, you know, she kind of got in the groove when she was having uh, a presentation speech. So in a way, you know, some people like these books better. Well, you know, we were talking earlier and you mentioned that um, all of her books and, and papers now are, are going to be archived by Stanford University, that they're going to bring someone on board to look, manage her, her writings. Mm -hmm. So maybe there'll be a way to, will there be additional books written, do you think? Or yeah, absolutely. That? They're going to they're gonna do two new books, as far as I know, one book for the public and one book for academics. And so I'm kind of interested to see how they differentiate that. But uh, I had about 120 gallons of boxes worth of tapes that had not wow. been transcribed. So there's a lot of material there. Uh, so I'm, I'm anxious because we had meant to do it and we kind of never got around to it. But there's a lot of material there of my mom's, you know, work that is, uh, was saved from the fire for one and two has never re really been made public. So, or maybe it was one speech that one group of people saw, but then no one else has seen it in 30 years. So it's amazing. It always makes me depressed when I think that there's so much technology now that can record things. And I mean, the videos I've seen of her are very low quality because they're just so old. And right. I hope that maybe Stanford can use some of its magical technology to re uh, rejuvenate them. Yes, that's exactly what they're going to do. So they're working <laughs> on that right now as we speak. <laughs> did, they, did she ever publish that little book called uh, Letter to Dougie? Yes, the Dougie Letter. We still sell it through the website. Um, and it's available maybe in about 15 different languages. It's in Russian, Greek, Spanish, French, Italian. So it's still a very popular uh, little pamphlet. The reason I love it is that children, they are so, um, well, it's a lovely little book for those who, those who don't know about it. It's a little, it's a letter to a child. Is it child with cancer or about yeah. explaining, yeah. explaining why children, why, why death happens, you know, why people die. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really moving. But the reason I ask it is that children seem to have near death experience like experiences all the time. Like they oh, yeah. see things, they, they are connected. Do you agree with that? 
Oh, yeah. My mother said, you know, the great thing about children is they're not kind of contaminated by being adults and, you know, whatever we're, we're taught as being education. Yeah. So they, she said children really get it much more than we give them credit for, you know, and they often talk about seeing their playmates, you know, which we just dismiss as play, but they're really seeing spiritual guides. And did she believe that too? I mean, I never talked to her about this. And I, I think it's well, partly because we were always so busy doing these life death transition workshops. And it was like, you know, just a lot of emotion around it. But did she personally feel that uh, there were no well, spiritual guys or no, people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like my mother, you know, saying, do you believe in air or, you know, I mean, <laughs> sorry, I obvious like, question. What, what are you even talking about? Why do you even ask that question? <laughs> of course. <laughs> so yeah, for her, you know, I mean, she often talked about it. And uh, uh, one thing people don't know, which I find fascinating is in 1969 in On Death and Dying, my mother had a chapter about NDEs and life after death. But the publisher and her best friend said it was way too controversial, and she was basically forced to take it out of the book. So while Raymond Moody does get rightful credit for you know bringing this to the public, my mother actually wrote about it in the 60s, and she had to back off. He coined the phrase, but she, she really brought it into the world. I mean, Dr. Moody is wonderful. He's very much an academic, though, himself. He's a philosopher, mm -hmm. and he's trying to solve the mysteries of the universe with linguistics and language, and, um, but he's, he's interesting. But yeah, but your mother had such an impact, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us. Now, you're running the, the foundation now, but you're a photographer by profession, right. and mm -hmm. KenRossPhotography.com. Right. I decided when I was young, I, I, both my parents were talking about death at the dinner table all the time. And so I was like, wow, life must be short and precarious. I want to live a really fun life. So I decided to be a travel photographer. Well, I know that you're a good one, but you're also a great son to have carried on her work with such diligence because, you know, like you, we talked about in another video, it wasn't easy for her. And this, um, oh, I don't know, this sort of the evolution of her, the acceptance of her work is and the impact that she had is a gift that you're giving to us. Still evolving in society. I see some people get it and some people still kind of get angry about it or fight it or don't understand it. And it's kind of interesting how it brings out the anger in some people, you know, yeah. who have anger issues about death or facing their own death or deaths in their family and so forth. Well, there's a Tibetan monk or nun, her name is Pema Chodron, and she wrote this, she has a quote, something like, um, you know, when you're feeling fear, it means you're getting closer to the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy journey, is it? Mm -hmm. It's true. <laughs> so you've got a book celebration, 50 year celebration for on death and dying, and hopefully some new publications coming out. But, um, but the website is ekrfoundation.com. Dot com. Dot Dot org. Dot org. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. ekrfoundation.org. And right. uh, thank you so much, Ken, from the bottom of my heart for actually being with us tonight and talking about uh, your mother, who I, I totally admire. And thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you for taking time to talk to me. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our Life After Death YouTube channel and visit our website at lifeafterdeath.com. We are a community of people who are fascinated by the topic of life after death and subjects like near-death experience, the afterlife, reincarnation, and spirituality. Together we are exploring and discovering these topics together with curiosity and an open heart.